Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me along. Um, so today I wanted to talk about, um, well, two things, really. Some of my rationale behind the work I do, the, the visualizations I create, and what kind of the thinking is behind it, um, and, and the process, and then also uh, yeah, give some examples of um, some of the problems that I've worked through uh, with uh, my own data visualization uh, work. So um, you've just heard all this, which is great. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, as I say, I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Geography at UCL. Um, so we're quite an interdisciplinary group within our team. Um, we have computer scientists and, and non-geographers involved as well. Um, uh, but pr primarily we're interested in, you know, where things are, where people go, um, uh, anything that's got a location on, on the Earth's surface. And um, kind of another big part of my day job is um, deputy director of this thing called the Consumer Data Research Center. So if any of you work with consumer data sets, um, what we do is we, uh, uh, we want to talk to you, we want to uh, get hold of your data if possible, we want to store it securely, um, and then we uh, do academic research with it and, uh, and share it with other, with other researchers. And then, um, uh, sort of a become a bit more of a hobby, really. Um, the rest of my life, I spend uh, doing uh, creating visualization books. So the first one I did was on London, and the second one on animals, and they're really going to be the focus of, of today. So if you do a, a Google image search for the word maps, this is um, this is what tends to to come up. So. You can see here, this is what we would sort of classically think of as a fairly traditional set of maps. Um, nice blues, greens, other sorts of colors like that. Um, not much here in terms of innovation or excitement, but certainly something much that's sort of very familiar. If you stick the word data visualization in front of that, you come up with something that looks like this. Um, lots of black backgrounds, lots of bright colors, lots of kind of futuristic uh, interpretations, perhaps, and so there seems to be this association between, um, you know, uh, what a map is, and it's kind of a bit boring, a bit blue, a bit green, versus uh, what data visualization maps are, um, in, in the sense of you know the, the kind of dark and futuristic colours, and so there's this kind of this tension that I sit between between those um, traditional cartographic representations, if you will, that have been. Um, created over sort of thousands of years of uh, mapping. And then these sort of newfangled things that have arrived um, as soon uh, since sort of computer scientists and other people have got hold of um, uh, big data sets and, and started to map them. And this tension is particularly interesting in the way that some of the data uh, are visualized and represented because, you know, in these kinds of maps, people make mistakes um, that have, uh, you know, long stopped being made um, in, in the traditional cartographic literature um, or, or representations. But then, so I guess I come to a room like this and I say, you know, we need to think more about how we visualize data. We need to sort of bring in some of the traditional uh, thinking on this. Likewise, though, when I go to cartography conferences, I'm telling them they all need to learn how to code and get real about, you know, the future of cartography, which uh, involves big data and, and mapping. So. Um, I kind of change my hat depending on my, my audience, um, and today I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that most of you guys are sort of datary types, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to talk a bit about how we can kind of do good and interesting uh, data visualization, particularly with large data sets where we're always very keen to show the complexity um, within them, perhaps at the expense of the stories that we're trying to tell. So my favorite example of this <coughs> Is quite an old one um, now, and it's uh, of a, a thing called a dot density map. So, on the left-hand side is a is a dot density map that was published on the Guardian Data Blog um, several years ago now, and the the headline was one dot for every person uh, in the UK. And and what happened here was that um, uh, the, they'd taken the census data. And the way that the census data get released are in these small units called output areas where about 250 people live in them. And um, what essentially what, what the happened programmatically was they took each area and then they put about 250 dots in each or whatever, depending on, on the, the, the actual population. 
So that made for kind of an interesting computational challenge, you know, 60 million dots on a map. But representationally, um, it kind of it failed in a number of ways, particularly in central London. So um, the first is you can see it gets completely saturated. So it works really well in, in, uh, in sort of slightly less populated areas where the, you've got more space for the dots. But because so many people live in London, you end up with this kind of like solid black uh, uh, area. And then the second thing was there wasn't much thought given to um, actually where people live. So one of the challenges with um, the census is, you know, they, uh, the areas have to sort of be next to one another. And so they, they do cover places where no one lives. So you can see, uh, those of you that are familiar with London, we've got lots of dots in Hyde Park, Regent's Park, um, Hampstead Heath, Lee Valley, um, Battersea Park, and so on. And so when you're looking at these things as a kind of uninformed or, or coming to these sort of cold as a, as a person that's not really seen maps or unfamiliar with London, you might be drawn to thinking that these are areas where people actually live, and of course they, they don't. Contrast that with the map on the right-hand side, which was actually done in the 1960s, 1968, Atlas of London, um, it's one of my prized eBay purchases. I got it for 15 pounds. Um, and it's, this thing is about this big and it has about 100 loose leaf uh, maps in it. Absolutely extraordinary piece of work. Um, uh, dot density map, but you can see that there's structure in the right hand side that you don't get on the left hand side. Um, and that's because they haven't been hung up on needing to uh, do a dot for every person. They've, they've done a dot for every 100 people or something like that. And in fact, you can see here, so it's every, it was a dot for every 500 people, but you can see here the other key thing that they've done is that they've um, closely related the dots to residential land use, avoiding uh, open spaces and parks, but also in industrial areas. And the reason they've done that is because they've thought about it a bit more. And the reason they've thought about it a bit more is because these people were having to draw the dots manually rather than programmatically. So if you've got to do the job once and you've got to do it manually, um, you know, you've got a bit more time to think about what it is you're doing, rather than just typing a few lines of computer code and, uh, hey presto, um, you, you get a map. So that's kind of my um, starting point for a lot of what I do. And so today I'm just going to talk about how um, you know, these things are kind of, we, 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 we work together really in terms of um, the computational side of uh, data visualization, but also the more kind of traditional side of, um, you know, thinking about uh, things. And so, as I say, most of this work is I'm going to talk about from the two books I've, I co-authored with uh, Oliver Uberti, who's a who's a designer. So the the key challenge with the first book was we needed to go from uh, this a, a table of data to uh, the finished spread that was to be printed um, every three days. Now, at the time when we were given a year by the publisher or so to write a book about London, that you know that seemed reasonable. But then when you break it down um, to the fact that we would promised 100 maps in the book, um, that, it, that is basically one every three days, give or take, plus you know, you've got to write the text for them, plus everything else. So. <clears throat> Obviously, there needed to be enormous efficiency savings in, in the way that we do things. You know, the kind of manual, traditional way of drawing maps wasn't going wasn't to cut it. So for most of what I did, um, uh, I turned to R. Um, so here's all the R code I used. Right, there's a couple of bits I'm missing um, at the top uh, to, to produce the map um, I just showed you. And the reason... Um, I like this example, uh, and, the, and I tend to use it, is because um, the data that we feature in it were actually released on the morning that we were due to submit the final book. And so we really knew, we knew that we wanted to uh, include this story about commuting flows in, in London. And uh, we had the 2001 census data. We knew how it was formatted. We knew what it would look like. So we could write the script. We could essentially sort out how it was going to look, and then I could just press go the morning it came out, and we could drop it in. So um, these are slightly tricky to see, sorry, on this projection, but the top one is how it looked uh, when I finished, uh, when I took it out of R, 
Uh, we just did black and white with a slight bit of transparency on the lines. And then the bottom one um, is, is, is how it ended up. So we've added a lot of labeling. We've added some effects uh, on InDesign and, and things like that that you can't really do in R. But um, the fundamentals, this idea that we've drawn tens of thousands of lines, you know, we're able, we, did, we did in R uh, pretty quickly and pretty efficiently. And there's a link to my blog at the end of this talk where the code for that is, uh, is, is available. So going through this work, we, we kind of generated a, a bit of a process. And this has been uh, quite interesting uh, to formalize for me and quite interesting, I think, for, for others to, to hear about. And so this mainly focuses on the stuff that I'm doing. Um, Oliver's stuff, I've somewhat um, over, you know, I've kind of just packed into this thing called layout, which actually is a lot more complicated than that, and final design, which of course has a lot more to it as well. But in terms of the things I'm thinking about, it's um, how you get the idea, where we source the data from, and those two things can, you might find some data and then get an idea, or you might have an idea and then have to go and find the data for it. You know, they don't necessarily occur in that order. And then I, I get to work trying to sort out some formatting and cleaning and uh, initial exploration and plotting. Now, that can all be um, done programmatically um, without the need to worry too much about, um, you know, let's say any kind of real manual intervention. You know, the plotting and things are kind of a useful sanity check. We then think about putting that work into a, a general layout, how it's going to look on the page, what the story is we're trying to tell. And then we may start again. You know, we may go back to the beginning here and, and, and go back through that process with the layout and the story in mind. And that's one of the things that we uh, came up against a lot, actually, when we were thinking about uh, the animal book, which I'll tell you about in a minute. When you're working with um, researchers who haven't necessarily visualized their data before, when you talk to them, they come up, they say, well, this is the story. This is what's really interesting. We then produce a, a, a map or a visualization for it. And they look at it and say, whoa, I didn't realize you know, the animal was behaving in that way or doing that thing. That's actually a much more interesting story. So we then go back around and, and, and do the process uh, straight off. But the key thing here is that you're doing the work with the final output in mind. Um, rather than just kind of doing it, getting an output, and then trying to get, squeeze that into your final visualization or plot. So once we've pinned everything down, we can do the plot. We can uh, export it. And you know, conventionally, we try and keep things in vector graphics format. So PDF uh, is the main one that we tend to use for that. And so I've just got a few examples here of how, um, you know, how I finished with something and then how it went over to um, and how it kind of ended up in the end. So this one looks a bit of a, this is a bit of a messy one because um, uh, it's missing, out. it's only part of the graphic. But one of the things we're trying to show were these lines um, of uh, population in London. And this is the kind of uh, messy version because this is residential population. This is when there's, there's no one at work. We actually have um, a daytime population one, which is this enormous spike in the middle of, uh, the city of London. But you can see here how we, this is how it came out of R. You can see I've added a big red line just to show, outline the, 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 the GLA. And then Oliver went in and, and did a, a decent amount of work trying to tidy up that edge a bit and then adding some of the labels and things like that. Um, uh, uh, so, um, you know, it's not necessarily, we're not aiming to necessarily have the finished product in R, but this is something that you can only really generate programmatically. Sometimes we had a kind of clear idea of what we were trying to show, and um, we were therefore able to kind of um, not really worry too much about how stuff was looking in R. We just wanted the basic components of the plot. We just wanted, in this case, the kind of ribbon plot that we were showing, some choral pleth maps. Uh, and then all that really mattered here was the fact that we kind of had unique colors and things like that that we were able to select and play around with once we brought it into the graphics package. So you can see here the two components coming in. Now, of course, if I wanted to generate lots of these or do it lots of times, then there's no reason why, actually, I couldn't um, specify colors and stuff uh, to make it look like this. But we, in this occasion, we kind of knew we were doing it, doing it once. And I think my, my, um, my kind of favorite example um, 
uh, of the of our process really was was looking at the the Tate um, uh, inventory. So, um, f for those of you who are kind of interested in open data and, and museums in particular, uh, there's a there's an increasing um, uh, lots of museums now putting their full inventory online. So, in this case, the Tate has put um, uh, all its uh, artworks, artists, their date of birth gender, name, so on and so forth, in, in a mega data dump online. Um, and lots of other museums do similar things. And we wanted to show um, how many artworks by each artist uh, were, 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 were in the Tate. And um, kind of the classic, well, kind of a, an, an easy way really of showing um, numbers, size of things, um, is a, a thing called a tree map. and. Um, that's the, that is the total code used to generate this particular tree map. So what we essentially did was we wanted to show, uh, just to create a whole load of squares that um, were scaled by the number of artworks per artist. And instantly you can see here that there's already kind of a story that, that comes out, which is there's one absolutely enormous square and then lots of kind of smaller ones. Um, I don't know if any of you can see this, but can anyone guess who that is? You might be able to just make out the name. Turner, exactly. So Turner put his whole life, when, when he died, his whole life went into the Tate. So they've got a huge amount of his stuff, um, you know, compared to maybe a sort of a fewer artworks from, from other artists. So, you know, that's, that's an interesting fact, but um, not a particularly arresting visualization, perhaps. So we started looking at this and thinking, well, how do we make it more interesting? And one of the key things, and again, this is a theme I'm going to return to at the end, is this idea of metaphor. Can you cut corners in the way that you're trying to um, tell people what's going on by using some kind of metaphor that they find instantly recognizable? So they look at something, they don't even know what it's showing, but they know what the broad topic area is. So in this case, we um, thought, well, these look like artworks. So they could be you know, individual squares, they could be pictures. So for the final graphic, we converted this display into a, a gallery wall, or in fact, a, a, gal a whole gallery space. So we licensed um, an image of uh, a Turner image, and so that filled out that really nice box um, uh, nicely. Uh, and then, um, actually, Oliver went in and uh, reordered things. So we then had chronological order here. So. Um, uh, from 1650 through to present day, and then actually sculpt, sculptures were, were pulled off, taken off the wall and pulled out onto the floor. So you don't really need to know, you know, what the actual kind of the details of this graphic are, but you do know that it's going to have something to do with art um, before you've even started. So, um, you know, th th this is essentially just a, a simple tree map, but because we've added the uh, the kind of the, the metaphor, it actually makes it a much more engaging uh, graphic for people to, to look at. And perhaps this is something that, you know, if I'd been working alone, it would never have turned out like this. You know, the value of having a designer as your co-author means that you can think a lot more creatively about the way you represent things. So that's kind of the, the first book, and that, that kind of... Um, uh, you know, eased us in, or it didn't really ease us in, it, it really pushed us into the uh, process of, you know, the collaboration, the data visualization work. Um, for the second book, we decided to do something completely different and um, look at the animal kingdom and actually revisit some of the stuff I was saying at the very beginning about these traditional representations of maps and cartography and things like that. So. Oliver was very interested uh, through his work at National Geographic with this uh, data uh, revolution that was occurring in, the, uh, in uh, uh, biology and zoology, and I'll talk briefly about that in a second. Um, I was very interested in using sort of traditional carto cartographic representation to show big data. So moving away from the black backgrounds and the bright colors um, to something that could look like a, a really nice map in a traditional atlas. Um, but it's actually behind that is some actually some pretty big complicated data sets. So the, the data we um, gathered or, or, or we, we had access to was shared by um, 
researchers who are doing some phenomenal work in this, uh, in this growing field called sort of biologging, where they're able to put tags on uh, pretty much any, any animal you can think of. So this goes on, or a, a tag like this goes on a, a whale, it's about the size of a computer mouse, uh, computer mouse, and then you can see there that they've even got radio tags that they can put on uh, bees now. The, the data these things um, generate de um, depend on the tag and the purpose, but the, the, the volumes are pretty phenomenal. So this, the, the orange uh, tag, uh, that can, that can uh, gather about 62 gigabytes of data in 24 hours whilst it's on a whale. So it's every single movement that the, the animal is doing, speed, pitch, yaw, um, depth, temperature, you know, it's just, uh, and even the sonar. So um, when a whale lets out a, a, a sonar buzz when it's hunting, um, all that uh, reflected sound that the whale is using to process, this tag is picking up as well, and you can actually see its hunting behaviors. Um, so, you know, it's actually a really sort of big data domain uh, now, and so many of the researchers are, you know, uh, 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 employing computer scientists, data scientists to run through their data and to do their work and sort of constructing almost like mission controls for, for animal data. So this is actually a, a, a picture I took at um, the University of Swansea where this is just a few minutes worth of data from a vulture uh, spiraling above uh, the Pyrenees. And um, you can kind of see the spiral uh, data it has with the altitude, but there's all kinds of other stuff, head movement, um, uh, and so on. So, you know, this is a massive interactive display, um, uh, but there's obviously lots of other things that, that, that can be extracted from this, and particularly, you know, how do you take that sort of information and make it digestible and interesting for um, uh, kind of non-specialist uh, researchers? So, Kind of a favorite example of this, um, the process we had to go through is, is with uh, these uh, seals. So I showed you a picture of a seal with um, a sensor stuck on uh, its head. The seals are, are, are collecting, they've kind of got two jobs. One is to collect data about their own behavior, but actually most of their work, or most of the justification of the tags is collecting oceanographic data. So seals are actually really useful uh, to gather temperature and salinity information uh, around the Southern Ocean. And so oceanographers, are, 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 they don't care so much about what the seals are doing, they just care about the data they're sending back. So this is uh, a, a kind of big hairball of data from several thousand seals um, swimming around um, Antarctica. And this really, for me, was what the book was all about. So when I first did this graphic, I think this was the, uh, the earliest graphic I did, I was like, right, this is brilliant. We're trying to make the case for big data. We're trying to uh, show that complexity. And, you know, this, this graphic has all of that. I sent it over to Oliver, whose um, instant reaction was to strip out all the color and, and, and disti the, the distinguishing features of each of the tracks and just highlight one or two tracks that tell a particular story. And this is a really important element of a storytelling process. You don't have to show everything at once to get the narrative across. And particularly, you know, the, the animal analogy I always find, if you watch the Planet Earth uh, TV series, you know, they'll, 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 you'll fly in over a, a flock of uh, gannets nesting in, on some, uh, in the Southern Ocean, but you'll only hear about two of them for most of the program. Um, because getting all that complexity at once is, is too much. So that's sort of what we're trying to do here, um, or, or that's, that was the start of our thinking. So Oliver said to me, well, we just want one or two kind of interesting journeys from interesting animals. So I selected uh, one seal called uh, Rudolph, and uh, we extracted his journey and uh, his track and his path. And the more we kind of thought about it, you know, with that big hairball in mind as well. The more we thought, actually, the, the big hairball's interesting, but it's not as interesting as just what this one seal is doing. And we started asking questions about what was the sea floor like he was passing over, what was the depth of the ocean, and so on and so forth. So the final graphic actually had uh, the hairball still in it, but um, scaled much uh, 
scaled down, it was an inset, much smaller. You could still see that there were loads of tracks. You could still see the um, individual colonies of seals. You couldn't make out necessarily individual seals, but you could see the different colonies, or different areas of, of seals. And then all our efforts went into telling Rudolph's story. So getting the ocean floor information, getting the behavioral information from the researchers uh, so that we could narrate and tell, uh, uh, say exactly what he was doing. And in fact, he got then a second page, um, double page spread, just showing the temperature information that he collected as well. So again, it was a very simple graph, um, but one that was quite important and, and one that kind of, uh, again, w people were able to engage with much more than just this mega hairball. And, and this is a case I often make um, for academics uh, in particular, because we, if we collect a load of data, we're really keen just to dump it all in a, in a paper and, 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 and kind of, you, you know, you don't really want to, your whole life, you don't want to, th you know, you, you, you train yourself not to throw things away. You want to keep as much data as possible. But sometimes uh, telling a story, um, it, even in an academic sense, is best done uh, just by focusing on just one or two elements of the data set. So the, the final example I want to leave you with is actually this very um, simple one. Uh, and it's one that probably I've spent, it's got to be top five, certainly top 10 of the hardest graphics I've had to do in terms of thinking about how you represent the data set. And um, part of the problem is it is a deceptively simple um, data set, that, but, but one that collected a huge amount of data. So just outside uh, Oxford, uh, is a, there's a, an area of woods that the university uh, intensively studies. And basically, every songbird in those woods has got a, a tiny tag on them um, that uh, enables them to be uh, detected every time they go to a particular feeder. So every time they're feeding or in their nesting box or anything like that, um, the, the, the bird is logged. And if you imagine, you know, there's hundreds or thousands of birds, each getting logged in all these different places, you know, the data set begins to grow uh, enormously. And the researchers are interested in lots of things, how information communicates between, uh, is, uh, information flows between these flocks, but particularly also what the flock dynamics are. So how these flocks of birds come together to feed and then how they dissipate. And the experiment they set up uh, for this was quite a simple one. Uh, four bird feeders um, in a grid and they were just uh, logging the birds every time they visited a feeder. The, the data, the way they represented the data was as a graph like this. So each block of lines here is an uh, individual feeder. Each color represents a particular species of bird. And we're going across three days here um, uh, during daylight hours. And if you kind of uh, squint at it, you can see that the um, areas of activity, so where the graphs start to spike, that shows there's lots of birds there. You can see that they all spike roughly at the same time around roughly the same feeder. So the theory was that birds prefer to feed with other birds. So you could have like the world's best bird feeder over there with, with uh, no activity around it. Um, the bird wouldn't go to that. It would much rather go to one that had loads of other birds around it already. It's a bit like us walking down a res uh, high street for looking at a restaurant. And you've got the empty one and the full one, and you think, well, maybe the full one's <laughs> worth waiting for if there's no one else in the other one. Um, it's exactly the same uh, logic. So um, we were like, well, how do we represent this in a slightly more compelling way, in a slightly easier way for people to understand? So the first thing we said was, well, we don't care that the, the pattern repeats itself every day. So three days we're not going to be that interested in. Um, why don't we just show one day's worth of data? Because that, that tells the story. Um, and then that, was the, then that was the really hard thing, was then how do you move away from these lines um, into something else? So one of the first plots I did, or and it wasn't what it was, it wasn't really, it was one of the tenth plots I did was um, this one where you have um, uh, each dot represents the occurrence of a bird each there's four feeders the feeders are running across here um, 
And it was this idea that you get clusters of dots um, uh, at particular moments in time when, when a bird would be present. And then I've actually I've drawn lines there which show individual birds. So you can see one bird flowing from one feeder to another. Now, we're not any further forward here um, in terms of making it easier and more accessible for people to understand. Um, but it gave us the breakthrough we needed, which was this idea that, well, OK, well, we've got these dots. And you could maybe think, well, maybe they look a bit like seeds. And uh, you know, that's, what are in the, that's what's in the bird feeders. So coming back to this idea of the Tate um, and this idea of a metaphor, um, you know, that's kind of the metaphor that, 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 we could, that could carry us through here. So in this particular case, we flipped them round. We made them look a bit like bird feeders. And uh, we colored them accordingly. So this is the final graphic. Here, you can see much more clearly, I think, than the, um, uh, uh, the, the lines, these clumps of activity that occur at particular times. You get a sense of the frenetic, freneticism of the, the birds flying around it. That's kind of what I was, that was my initial aspiration with the, 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 the previous plot. And we've simplified it so that we have a few, just a few lines showing uh, an individual from each species, how they fly from one feeder to the other. So you look at this spread, you get some sense that it's already, we're talking about bird feeders here. Then you can then move into the kind of the next element, which is uh, what exactly is the story here? Um, so it's a relatively simple data set. It had millions of uh, rows of data because these things were, the feeders were detecting birds at kind of, um, uh, I can't remember, a tenth of a second or something. It was, it was, it was pretty phenomenal. Um, but what we ended up with was a, a, a much sort of uh, reduced version of, of, of the data, but one that told the story that was kind of repeating itself over, over time. So um, I'll just leave that there. If anyone's interested in some of the code, um, in particular, there's um, my blog, spatial.ly. I've got kind of an R tag there. There's various things on there. Um, look, there's been a lot of um, interest lately because um, a graphic I did like three uh, back in 2013 of world population um, has been uh, in various places on the internet quite a lot the last few days. So I've actually just posted the code uh, that I used for that London population map on there. Um, and then, yeah, if you're interested in um, following my work, it's, uh, there's the Twitter, Twitter handle. So I'm welcome, um, more than happy to take any questions if you have any. Thanks very much. We have already one question at the front. <laughs> um, hi, thank you for that. That was um, uh, that was really good. That's really uh, informative. If you um, so, one question after doing kind of like a curation process or a post analysis of representation of data, what learnings would you take with you if you had to do real time representation? So obviously, some of the stuff that you did from R. Uh, is extrapolated and looks very different. Um, how would you do it if the the brief was a real time analysis? Uh, that's a good question. It's a very hard question. Um, I think the uh, well, I mean, I suppose in some well, in many respects, the same rules apply. So obviously, if if it, dep it depends on what your your do it right. So basically, if you're if you don't know what the data are, so suddenly you've got this stream of data and you're just trying to work out what, what the hell's in it, then um, I think that, in a sense, that is harder work. I mean, I think I would almost collect the data but then look at it over time rather than in the real-time context and, and see what the um, main patterns and stories are. I think the next step, if you're then trying to communicate that stream to other people and what it's showing, then I think many of the same rules apply in the sense that, you know, there's no reason why, okay, you're not going to be able to do things that are perhaps as tight as we're able to do in terms of the design elements. Um, and there are all kinds of other constraints to think about, particularly if you're moving to sort of interactivity and screen-based representation. But certainly, you know, the narrative, the, the metaphor, and um, 
just the clarity of, of the data. I mean, so we, we do very similar. So we, we, we've got some big real-time data streams at the moment. Um, and it's the same sort of decision-making processes. What stuff are we cutting out? What are we, how are we aggregating? How are we combining things over time? You do need everything every second, every five minutes, every hour, every day um, to at least get that initial message across. And then it will enable people to kind of zoom in um, uh, if they want the finer, finer scale details. Uh, okay, there's a question here, and then next one's over. The uh, second row, just from here. Uh, what about the availability of the uh, data? Because uh, I hear for nearly about two years, three years, speaking about open data uh, as national resources, because most of the time when we used uh, our, our packages of our most of it, it is uh, American uh, resources. Uh, I don't know what's happening. And the other thing is, uh, uh, I feel you, you used R only. Uh, are you satisfied with it? <laughs> uh, so, th in answer to the second question, am I satisfied? I use R only, am I satisfied? Uh, yes, I am. Um, uh, sometimes my life is made more difficult because I cling on to using R, but um, I see that's part of the challenge, really. Um, the, uh, in terms of the data availability, I mean, in the UK, I mean, London in particular, the whole, the basis of the book was about how much open data exists and how the city kind of benefits from data sharing. And so there is a big initiative, or there has been recently is a big initiative. My, my sense is that's starting to slow a bit now, actually. I think the, the pressure's coming off for, for open data. So there's been all these various threats. So like the land registry in the UK has a fantastic open data source that uh, almost sold off to a commercial entity. In the US, you know, um, lots of open data stores being, are under threat because they're not no longer considered a priority with the current administration. So I think there's lots of um, threats out there that kind of are slowing the, the progress of open data, but we have come a long way um, in, in the last few years. Uh, there was a, just a question over there by that pillar. Thanks. Um, so my question is about uh, the Tate example. So, um, so the first step, creating the plot in R, um, that was pretty quick as you showed the code. How much effort was it, how much effort was involved in the second step to create that graphics? And uh, what tools was used to create? Did, they, did those tools integrate with R easily? Or did you, essentially, did you, did you need to create every single thing from scratch? Yeah, so in, 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 in that case, it was a manual job. Um, to, so Oliver pulled, every, so basically, every, he pulled everything out and, and, and did it all manually. To him, that was, uh, I think still a massive efficiency saving because without the R step, he would have been having to draw every single box and scale it individually as well. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that's, we, again, with book stuff, we kind of, particularly when we're under pressure, you know, sometimes it is just quicker just to, you know, it's a few hours work, but you get it done. It would have been more time for me to try and work out how to code that. Um, uh, but of course, you know, there's various other projects we do where we have to, I mean, I'm, I'm just doing something at the moment where I'm having to generate, I don't know, whatever, 1,500 odd plots. Um, you know, obviously the efficiency is in coding it so that you don't then have to mess around with it manually afterwards. Um, but yeah, that, that final step is still kind of, yeah, there's, there's still a, a, a large manual component to that uh, for sure. Um, have we got time for any more questions? Uh, we'll go. Late, we'll so. go on that. S s just to, so that we balance the room. Uh, hi. Yeah. Could you talk quickly about the the collaboration you had with Oliver and how that worked? Working with a designer who, I guess, typically comes at data in in quite a different way. What What did you find was effective? That kind of stuff. Yeah. So the the. So the world he existed in, 
at, at national. So, so, so our very first collaboration was for National Geographic. So basically, he um, we did a map of North American names. It was a typographic map, and you positioned names in the states based on the popularity. So he first, or his team first approached me asking for the data because it was something I did. So I, I gave them a spreadsheet of data um, that then disappeared and came back as a map. And their, their process was very manual. So basically they would manually scale the text, position it and so on and so forth because um, they had the resource uh, to, to do that. And it was their the mentality of the magazine was kind of like take your time and, and, and do a really thorough sort of manual job. Obviously, coming into the, the stuff we were doing with the books, then that process wasn't, it just wasn't sustainable. And I think in present day, it's just not sustainable anyway. So um, we, uh, we work very uh, closely together uh, every step. So <clears throat> we'll have an idea, we'll kind of pitch it to one another, and then we'll think about how it will look. Um, and then I can work with the data with that in mind. I think one of the, one of the limitations with um, uh, kind of conventional approaches to academic designer relationships or others is that I'll do something, think it's finished, send it to him, and then he's got to try and make it fit on a page and look good. And in fact, that is often a compromise. It's always better to get a designer in much earlier so that you can be working with it in mind. So. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our, and our, our general ethos is kind of play to our strengths, really. Um, and I think that helps, you know, we, in, it takes both of us to do the books. It's not something we can do individually, I think, in, in, in the stuff we do. Okay, I'm afraid that's about all we'll have time for now. Um, I'm sure we all want to thank uh, Dr. James Cheshire for a really fascinating and really beautiful presentation. And um, it's now 10.30, and we're going to have a coffee break until 11 o'clock. And then we'll meet um, everybody back at 11 for the next presentation. Thank you very much, and thank you again for coming. And thank you to James Cheshire. <laughs>